You are listening to an Auditory Entertainment's production. Operation Haystack by Frank Herbert Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson When the Investigation and Adjustment Scout Cruiser landed on Merrick, it carried a man the doctors had no hope of saving. He was alive only because he was in a womb-like creche pod that had taken over most of his vital functions. The man's name was Louis Orne. He had been a blocky, heavy-muscled redhead with slightly off-center features and the hard flesh of a heavy planet native. Even in the placid repose of near death, there was something clownish about his appearance. His burnt, ungent-covered face looked made up for some bizarre show. Merrick is the league capital, and the IA Medical Center there is probably the best in the galaxy. But it accepted the creche pod and Orn more as a curiosity than anything else. The man had lost one eye, three fingers of his left hand, and part of his hair, suffered a broken jaw, and various internal injuries. He had been in terminal shock for more than 90 hours. Umbo Stetson, Orn's section chief, went back into his cruiser's office after a hospital flitter took pod and patient. There was an added droop in Stetson's shoulders that accentuated his usual slouching stance. His over-large features were drawn into ridges of sorrow. A general, straggling, trampish look about him was not helped by patched blue fatigues. The doctor's words still rang in Stetson's ears. This patient's vital tone is too low to permit operative replacement of damaged organs. He'll live for a while because of the pod, but... And the doctor had shrugged. Stetson slumped into his desk chair looked out the open port beside him. Some four hundred meters below, the scurrying, beetle-like activity of the IA's main field sent up discordant roaring and clattering. Two rows of other scout cruisers were parked in line with Stetson's port, gleaming red and black needles. He stared at them without really seeing them. It always happens on some routine assignment, he thought. Nothing but a slight suspicion about Haleb. The fact that only women held high office. One simple, unexplained fact, and I lose my best agent. He sighed, turned to his desk, began composing the report. The militant core on the planet Heleb has been eliminated. Occupation force on the ground. No further danger to galactic peace expected from this source. Reason for operation? Rediscovery and re-education after two years on the planet, failed to detect signs of militancy. The major indications were 1. A ruling caste restricted to women, and 2. Disparity between the numbers of males and females far beyond the Lutig norm. Senior field agent Lewis Orne found that the ruling caste was controlling the sex of offspring at conception, see attached details, and had raised a male slave army to maintain its rule. The R&R &R agent had been drained of information, then killed. Arms constructed on the basis of that information caused crucial injuries to senior field agent Orne. He is not expected to live. I am hereby urging that he receive the Galaxy Medal, and that his name be added to the Roll of Honor. Stetson pushed the page aside. That was enough for Comgo, who never read anything but the first page anyway. Details were for his aides to chew and digest. They could wait. Stetson punched his desk call box for Orne's service record, set himself to the task he most detested, notifying next of kin. He read, pursing his lips. Home planet, Shargon. Notify in case of accident or death, Miss Victoria Orne, mother. He leafed through the pages, reluctant to send the hated message. Orne had enlisted in Merrick Marines at age 17, a runaway from home, and his mother had given post-enlistment consent. Two years later, scholarship transfer to Uni Galactica, the R&R &R school here on Merrick. Five years of schooled and one R&R &R field assignment under his belt, and he had been drafted into the IA for brilliant detection of militancy on Hamel. And two years later, kaput. Abruptly, Stetson hurled the service record at the gray metal wall across from him. Then he got up, 
brought the record back to his desk, smoothing the pages. There were tears in his eyes. He flipped a switch on his desk, dictated the notification to Central Secretarial, ordered it sent out priority. Then he went groundside and got drunk on Hosher Brandy, Orn's favorite drink. The next morning there was a reply from Shargan. Lewis Orn's mother, too ill to travel, sisters being notified. Please ask Mrs. Ipscott Bullion of Merrick, wife of the High Commissioner, to take over for family. It was signed. Madrina Orne Standish, sister. With some misgivings, Stetson called the residence of Ipscott Bullion, leader of the majority party in the Merrick Assembly. Miss Bullion took the call with blank screen. There was a sound of rushing water in the background. Stetson stared at the grayness swimming in his desk visor. He always disliked a blank screen. A baritone husk of a voice slid. This is Polly Bouillon. Stetson introduced himself, relayed the Shargan message. Victoria's boy dying? Here? Oh, the poor thing. And Madrina's back on Shargan. The election. Oh, yes, of course. I'll get right over to the hospital. Stetson signed off, broke contact. The High Commissioner's wife yet, he thought. Then, because he had to do it, he walled off his sorrow, got to work. At the medical center, the oval creche containing Orn hung from ceiling hooks in a private room. There were humming sounds in the dim, watery greenness of the room, rhythmic chuggings, sighings. Occasionally, a door opened almost soundlessly and a white-clad figure would check the graph tapes on the creche's meters. Orne was lingering. He became the major conversation piece at the intern's coffee breaks. That agent who was hurt on Hellub? He's still with us. Man, they must build those guys different from the rest of us. Yeah, understand he's only got an eighth of his insides. Liver, kidneys, stomach, all gone. Lay your odds he doesn't last out the month. Look what old sure thing McTavish wants to bet on. On the morning of his 88th day in the creche, the day nurse came into Orrin's room, lifted the inspection hood, and looked down at him. The day nurse was a tall, lean-faced professional who had learned to meet miracles and failures with equal lack of expression. However, this routine with the dying IA operative had lulled her into a state of psychological unpreparedness. Any day now. Poor guy, she thought and she gasped as she opened his sole remaining eyelid, said, Did they clobber those dames on Hellub? Yes, sir, she blurted. They really did, sir. Good. Orne closed his eye. His breathing deepened. The nurse rang frantically for the doctors. It had been an indeterminate period on a blank fog for Orne, then a time of pain and the gradual realization that he was in a creche. Had to be. He could remember his sudden exposure on Hellub. The explosion, then nothing. Good old Creche. It made him feel safe now, shielded from all danger. Orm began to show minute but steady signs of improvement. In another month, doctors had ventured an intestinal graph that gave him a new spurt of energy. Two months later, they replaced missing eye and fingers, restored his scalp line, worked artistic surgery on his burn scars. Fourteen months, eleven days, Five hours and two minutes after he had been picked up, as good as dead, Orne walked out of the hospital under his own power, accompanied by a strangely silent Umbo Stetson. Under the dark blue IA field cape, Orne's coverall uniform fitted his once muscular frame like a deflated bag, but the pixie light had returned to his eyes, even to the eye he had received from a nameless and long-dead donor. Except for the loss of weight, he looked to be the same Lewis Orne, if he was different, beyond the spare parts, it was something he only suspected. Something that made the idea twice born. Not a joke. Outside the hospital, clouds obscured Merrick's green sun. It was mid-morning. A cold spring wind bent the pile lawn, tugged fitfully at the border plantings of exotic flowers around the hospital's landing pad. Orn paused on the steps above the pad, breathed deeply of the chill air. Beautiful day, he said. Stetson reached out a hand to help Orne down the steps, hesitated, 
put the hand back in his pocket. Beneath the section chief's look of weary superciliousness, there was a note of anxiety. His big features were set in a frown. The drooping eyelids failed to conceal a sharp, measuring stare. Orn glanced at the sky to the southwest. The flitter ought to be here any minute. A gust of wind tugged at his cape. He staggered, caught his balance. I feel... good. You look like something left over from a funeral, growled Stetson. Sure, my funeral, said Orn. He grinned. Anyway, I was getting tired of that walk-around type morgue. All my nurses were married. I'd almost stake my life that I could trust you, muttered Stetson. Orn looked at him. No, no, Stet. Stake my life. I'm used to it. Stetson shook his head. No, damn it. I trust you, but you deserve a peaceful convalescence. We've no right to saddle you with... Stet? Orn's voice was low, amused. Huh? Stetson looked up. Let's save the noble act for someone who doesn't know you, said Orn. You've a job for me. Okay, you've made the gesture for your conscience. Stetson produced a wolfish grin. All right. So we're desperate, and we haven't much time. In a nutshell, since you are going to be a house guest at the Bouillons, we suspect Ipscott Bouillon of being the head of a conspiracy to take over the government. What do you mean, take over the government? demanded Orn. The Galactic High Commissioner is the government, subject to the Constitution and assemblymen who elected him. We have a situation that could explode into another rim war, and we think he's at the heart of it, said Stetson. We've 81 touchy planets, all of them old line steadies that have been in the League for years. And on every one of them, we have reason to believe there's a clan of traitors sworn to overthrow the League, even on your home planet, Chargon. You want me to go home for my convalescence? asked Orn. Haven't been there since I was 17. I'm not sure that... No, damn it. We want you as the Bullion's house guest. And speaking of that, would you mind explaining how they were chosen to ride herd on you? There's an odd thing, said Orn. All those gags in the IA about old, upshook Ipscott Ballone. And then I find that his wife went to school with my mother. Have you met himself? He brought his wife to the hospital a couple times. Again, Stetson looked to the southwest, then back to Orn. A pensive look came over his face. Every school kid knows how the Nathians and the Marcaean League fought it out in the Rim War. How the old civilizations fell apart, and it all seems kind of distant, he said. Five hundred standard years, said Orn. And maybe no farther away than yesterday, murmured Stetson. He cleared his throat. And Orn wondered why Stetson was moving so cautiously. Something deep troubling him. A sudden thought struck Orn. He said, You spoke of trust. Has this conspiracy involved the IA? We think so, said Stetson. About a year ago, an R&R &R archaeological team was nosing around some ruins on Dobby. The place was all but vitrified in the Rim War, but a whole bank of records from an Athian outpost escaped. He glanced sidelong at Orn. The R&R &R boys couldn't make sense out of the records. No surprise. They called in an IA crypt analyst. He broke a complicated substitution cipher. When the stuff started making sense, he pushed the panic button. For something the Nathians wrote 500 years ago? Stetson's drooping eyelids lifted. There was a cold quality to his stare. This was a routing station for key Nathian families, he said. Trained refugees. An old dodge. Been used as long as there have been... But 500 years, Stet? I don't care if it was 5,000 years, barked Stetson. We've intercepted some scraps since then that were written in the same code. The bland confidence of that. Wouldn't that gall you? He shook his head. And every scrap we've intercepted deals with the coming elections. But the election is only a couple days off, protested Orn. Stetson glanced at his wrist chrono. Forty-two hours to be exact, he said. Some deadline. 
Any names in these old records? asked Orn. Stetson nodded. Names of planets, yes. People, no. Some code names, but no cover names. Code name on Shargon was Winner. That ring any bells with you? Orn shook his head. No. What's the code name here? The head, said Stetson. But what good does that do us? They've sure to have changed those by now. They didn't change their communications code, said Orn. No, they didn't. We must have something on them, some leads, said Orn. He felt that Stetson was holding back something vital. Sure, said Stetson. We have history books. They say the Nathians were top drawer in political mechanics. We know for a fact they chose landing sites for their refugees with diabolical care. Each family was told to dig in, grow up with the adopted culture, develop the weak spots, build an underground, train their descendants to take over. They set out to bore from within, to make victory out of defeat. The Nathians were long on patience. They came originally from nomad stock on Nathia too. Their mythology calls them Arbs, or Iribs. Go review your 7th grade history. You'll know almost as much as we do. Like looking for a traditional needle in the haystack, muttered Orn. How come you suspect High Commissioner Upshook? Stetson wet his lips with his tongue. One of the Bullion's seven daughters is currently at home, he said. Name's Diana, a field leader in the IA Women. One of the Nathian code messages we intercepted had her name as addressee. Who sent the message? asked Orn. What was it all about? Stetson coughed. <clears throat> you know, Lou, we cross-check everything. This message was signed M.O.S., the only MOS that came out of the comparison was on a routine next-of-kin reply. We followed it down to the original copy, and the handwriting checked, Name of Madrina Orn Standish. Maddie? Orn froze, turned slowly to face Stetson. So that's what's troubling you? We know you haven't been home since you were seventeen, said Stetson. Your record with us is clean. The question is... Permit me, said Orn. The question is, will I turn in my own sister if it falls that way? Stetson remained silent, staring at him. Okay, said Orn. My job is seeing that we don't have another rim war. Just answer me one question. How's Maddie mixed up in all this? My family isn't one of those traitor clans. This whole thing is all tangled up with politics, said Stetson. We think it's because of her husband. Ah, the member for Shargan, said Orn. I've never met him. He looked to the southwest, where a flitter was growing larger as it approached. Who's my cover contact? That mini transceiver we planted in your neck for the Ganea job, said Stetson. It's still there and functioning. Anything happens around you, we hear it. Orn touched the sub-vocal stud at his neck moved his speaking muscles without opening his mouth. A surf-hissing voice filled the matching transceiver in Stetson's neck. You pay attention while I'm making a play for this Diana Bullion, you hear? Then you'll know how an expert works. Don't get so interested in your work that you forget why you're out there, growled Stetson. Miss Bullion was a fat little mouse of a woman. She stood almost in the center of the guest room of her home, hands clasped across the paunch of a long, dull silver gown. She had demure gray eyes, grandmotherly gray hair combed straight back in a jeweled net, and that shocking baritone husk of a voice issuing from a small mouth. Her figure sloped out from several chins to a matronly bosom, then dropped straight like a barrel. The top of her head came just above Orne's dress epaulets. We want you to feel at home here, Lewis, she husked. You're to consider yourself one of the family. Orn looked around at the bullion guest room, low-key furnishings with an old-fashioned selectacle for change of decor. A parlor window looked out onto an oval swimming pool, the glass muted to dark blue. It gave the outside a moonlight appearance. There was a contour bed against one wall, several built-ins, 
and a door partly open to reveal bathroom tiles. Everything traditional and comfortable. I already do feel at home, he said. You know, your house is very like our place on Shargan. I was surprised when I saw it from the air. Except for the setting. It looks almost identical. I guess your mother and I shared ideas when we were in school, said Polly. We were very close friends. You must have been to do all this for me, said Orn. I don't know how I'm ever going to... Ah, here we are. A deep masculine voice boomed from the open door behind Orn. He turned, saw Ipscott Bullion, High Commissioner of the American League. Bullion was tall, had a face of harsh angles and deep lines, dark eyes under heavy brows, black hair trained in receding waves. There was a look of ungainly clumsiness about him. He doesn't strike me as the dictator type, thought Orn, but that's obviously what Stet suspects. Glad you made it out all right, son, boomed Bullion. He advanced into the room, glanced around. Hope everything's to your taste here. Lewis was just telling me that our place is very like his mother's home on Shargan, said Polly. It's old-fashioned, but we like it, said Bullion. Just a great big tetragon on a central pivot. We can turn any room we want to the sun, or shade, or the breeze, but we usually leave the main salon pointing northeast. View of the capital, you know. We have a sea breeze in Shargan that we treat the same way, said Orn. I'm sure Lewis would like to be left alone for a while now, said Polly. This is his first day out of the hospital. We mustn't tire him. She crossed to the Polly window, adjusted it to neutral gray, turned the select goal, and the room's color dominance shifted to green. There. That's more restful, she said. Now. If there's anything you need, you just ring the bell there by your bed. The auto butler will know where to find us. The bullions left, and Orn crossed to the window, looked out at the pool. The young woman hadn't come back. When the chauffeur-driven limousine flitter had dropped down to the house's landing pad, Orn had seen a parasol and a sun hat nodding to each other on the blue tiles beside the pool. The parasol had shielded Polly Bullion. The sun hat had been worn by a shapely young woman in swimming tights, who had rushed off into the house. She was no taller than Polly, but slender and with golden red hair caught under her sun hat in a swimmer's chingon. She was not beautiful, face too narrow with suggestions of Bullion's cragginess, and the eyes were over large. But her mouth was full-lipped, chin strong, and there had been an air of exquisite assurance about her. The total effect had been one of striking elegance extremely feminine. Orn looked beyond the pool, wooden hills and dimly on the horizon, a broken line of mountains. The Bullions lived in expensive isolation. Around them stretched miles of wilderness, rugged with planned neglect. Time to report in, he thought. Orn pressed the neck stud on his transceiver, got Stetson, told him what had happened to this point. All right, said Stetson. Go find the daughter. She fits the description of the gal you saw by the pool. That's what I was hoping, said Orn. He changed into light blue fatigues, went to the door of his room, let himself out into a hall. A glance at his wrist chrono showed that it was shortly before noon. Time for a bit of scouting before they called lunch. He knew from his brief tour of the house and its similarity to the home of his childhood that the hall led into the main living room. The public rooms and men's quarters were in the outside ring. Secluded family apartments and women's quarters occupied the intersection. Orn made his way to the salon. It was long, built around two sections of the tetragon, and with low divans beneath the view windows. The floor was thick pile rugs, pushed one against another in a crazy patchwork of reds and browns. At the far end of the room, someone in blue fatigues like his own, was bent over a stand of some sort. The figure straightened. At the same time, a tinkle of music filled the room. He recognized the red-gold hair of the young woman he had seen beside the pool. She was wielding two mallets to play a stringed instrument that lay on its side supported by a carved wood stand. He moved up behind her, his footsteps muffled by the carpeting. 
The music had a curious rhythm that suggested figures dancing wildly around firelight. She struck a final chord, muted the strings. That makes me homesick, said Orn. Oh! She whirled, gasped, then smiled. You startled me. I thought I was alone. Sorry. I was enjoying the music. I'm Diana Bullion, she said. You are Mr. Orne. Lou, to all the Bullion family, I hope, he said. Of course, Lou, she gestured at the musical instrument. This is very old. Most find its music, well, rather weird. It's been handed down for generations in my mother's family. The Kythra, said Orne. My sisters play it. Been a long time since I've heard one. Oh, of course, she said. Your mother's... She stopped, looking confused. I've got to get used to the fact that you're... I mean, that we have a strange man around the house who isn't exactly strange. Orn grinned. In spite of the blue IA fatigues and rather severe pulled-back hairdo, this was a handsome woman. He found himself liking her and this caused him a feeling of near self-loathing. She was a suspect. He couldn't afford to like her. But the Bullions were being so decent, taking him in like this. And how was their hospitality being repaid? By spying and prying. Yet, his first loyalty belonged to the IA, to the peace it represented. He said rather lamely, I hope you get over the feeling that I'm strange. I'm already over it, she said. She linked arms with him, said, If you feel up to it, I'll take you on the deluxe guided tour. By nightfall, Orne was in a state of confusion. He had found Diana fascinating, and yet the most comfortable woman to be around that he had ever met. She liked swimming, paloika hunting, ditar apples. She had a poo-poo attitude towards the older generation that she said she'd never before revealed to anyone. They had laughed like fools over utter nonsense. Orne went back to his room to change for dinner, stopped before the Paula window. The quick darkness of these low latitudes had put an ibbon blanket over the landscape. There was a city glow off to the left, and an orange halo to the peaks where Merrick's three moons would rise. Am I falling in love with this woman? He asked himself. He felt like calling Stetson. Not to report, but just to talk the situation out, and this made him acutely aware that Stetson, or an aide, had heard everything said between them that afternoon. End of Part 1 of Operation Haystack by Frank Herbert This has been an Auditory Entertainment's production. If you enjoyed this performance, please subscribe. Thank you for listening.